Hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for another episode of Inside the Markets on the Stock Pulse Network. And I'm excited to have on a colleague of mine who also writes for Miles Franklin, as well as his own site, The Deviant Investor, and that is Gary Christensen who is kind enough to join us today with the stock market down again. A lot of people looking to gold and silver and a complete mess in Washington. So Gary, it's great to have you on the show and break all these things down. How are you doing today, my friend? Well, doing fine. Thank you for having me. Yeah, well, it's a pleasure to catch up with you. And like we were talking about just before we got started, stock market is down again, obviously, to some is coming as a surprise or confused, but folks like yourself who've been writing about gold and silver, money printing, and the consequences of that for quite a while, um, almost to be expected. So I'd love to get your take on what's happening. Are the bubbles popping? And uh, where does everything stand in your opinion? Well, I offer my opinion. You know, I'm not a certified uh, analyst. Um, don't have a piece of paper. I'm just a guy who, spends a lot of time looking at markets and I like mathematics and I like studying the, 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 um, the data. I want everything to be data driven. So if you look at the markets, let's start with the stock market. It's been going up for a long, long time. We all know that markets don't last forever, but you know, that then calling the top is tough. But if you look at any number of measures, whether you look at the internals or the advanced decline or the, uh, the ratios that it has to many other things, uh, John Hussman has done a marvelous job of documenting all of the outrageous uh, extremes in the stock markets. And he even goes so far as to say, expect no return over the next 12 years and a two thirds or more drop from here, um, which is, you know, a pretty substantial drop. And, and his credibility, I find very high. Um, we can believe the Wall Street analysts who are going to say everything's going up forever. And of course, we know that's nonsense. Um, the same goes in reverse for gold and silver. You can believe the analysts that are telling you, like Harry Dent, that's going to tell you the gold is going to four hundred dollars or two hundred and fifty or seven hundred or whatever. Um, but that doesn't ring very true to me. If you look at ratios going back over 30, 40 years of the Dow to gold or gold to silver or silver to M2 or silver to national debt or gold to national debt, any number of those ratios, they all tell you the same thing. The bottom line is the Dow and the S&P and the NASDAQ are too high and are likely to correct. Now, I happen to think, I've been saying that all year, and it looks like they're finally correcting. Um, if you look at the gold and silver markets, you have to say, by any measure of ratios to uh, other markets, to debt, to M2, to um, uh, the stock markets, they're too low. So you have to expect the gold and silver will be going up. Now, I've been saying that for several years. And for several years, gold and silver haven't done a lot. In fact, they, they bottomed in... Um, December of 2015, and they're barely above those highs. And silver's like a buck higher than it was then. Gold's a little bit higher than it was then. The bottom occurred. If you look at um, a long-term chart, say back the last, last decade, you'll see a very nice head and shoulders, reverse head and shoulders form on gold. And um, um, Graceland, uh, whatever his name, uh, Stuart Thompson, I guess it is, Graceland Updates. He has a very nice chart on that out uh, that shows the head and shoulders, reverse head and shoulders on gold. Bottom line out of all that is, I think it's fairly clear that we're in a stock market correction and we're beginning, and I'm just anxious as can be and so disappointed that it's taken so long, a final correction upward in gold and silver prices. So that's kind of the big picture overview of the way I see the markets right now. Right, and in terms of the stock market, at least the way I've been looking at it and writing and saying in the interviews, there could be a lot of different sparks. Maybe there's a war, hopefully not, um, you know, or it could be some completely unexpected thing. Maybe someone leaves OPEC, which is interesting. I've wondered about that for years, and yesterday there was a story that Qatar is considered leaving OPEC. We also have Petro Yuan, so. A lot of things that could be the trigger, although perhaps what I always thought of as the most likely one is the same one that 
caused the collapse in the last bubble, the rising interest rates. And I've been thinking that the more rates go up, the more likely the bubbles are to pop and the sooner that is to happen. Curious if you agree with that and is that why the real estate market is slowing down at this particular time when rates are going up and also why we're seeing the stock market slow down at this time as well? Well, I do agree with that in, in large measure. I think that when you raise interest rates, you, you bring out, you know, as Warren Buffett says, you never know who's swimming naked until the tide goes out. Well, when you raise interest rates, the tide goes out. The tide of easy money pouring into the markets and just covering over all manner of sins and, and malinvestments. You raise the interest rates, things get squeezed. And things at that point in the economy, in the markets, in corporate balance sheets are squeezed. It's harder to meet debt service. I mean, we're at 3% on, on the T-bond, actually, or the 10-year T-note. Actually, it's down a little bit today, the, the interest rate. But that's really not much. And yet people are squeezed. Corporate credit card debt is huge. Student loan interest is over, student loan debt is over a trillion and a half. These things aren't going to survive in their current form without massive corrections. And the stock market is gradually realizing that the boom times are over because the Federal Reserve is not doing more QE. The only QE has been coming from the Bank of um, the Bank of Japan and the European Central Bank, the Federal Reserve is actually squeezing tighter and extracting money from the system. And eventually, the stock market has to take notice and realize that, and then people decide they want to sell. Well, it doesn't take a specific, um, a specific event to kick the markets over. No, it doesn't. It can be like... Um, um, People describe the last grain of sand or the last snowflake that causes the avalanche, or it can be a specific event. It can be the rise in um, interest rates that are pushing things. It can be uh, a, a, a crash in oil prices. It could be a, a massive rise in oil prices. It could be any number of things that finally push the system over the edge. The real issue, in my opinion, is how unstable is the system? And I believe that when you create massive amounts of printed dollars and euros and yen from nothing, you increase the instability of the system. So if you've got an unstable system, all you're really doing is waiting till something triggers that avalanche. And then once the avalanche starts, and you know people who've gone through market crashes understand this, if you haven't gone through a market crash, you don't really see it. Um, somebody sells, somebody else sells, somebody else sells, a margin call happens, two more people sell, then a thousand more people sell, and it avalanches down. It's like a waterfall decline. And you look at it and you say, but what happened to my beautiful illusion? Amazon was going to go to 3,000. It went to 2,050. Can't it go to 3,000? And instead it drops $100 that day and $1,000 the next week or whatever. I mean, I'm not saying Amazon will, but Amazon's clearly overpriced, just like Netflix and the other bang stocks. And they're clearly going to drop. They have been dropping, in fact, and they've dropped way over 20%. Um, these things happen because they get overvalued and the flow of easy money that levitates those markets dries up. You dry up the low, the, the flow of money into them and the ship sinks. Yeah. And Gary, I appreciate you pointing out Amazon, perhaps uh, the epitome of, of the insanity in the stock market. I think back in 2008 or 2009, it was around 50 bucks. Now it's close to 2000. So like you pointed out earlier, we've seen since the QE program started, since the 0% interest rate started, we've seen the stock market go wild. You know, most of the, I think the Dow's up three or four fold, NASDAQ up even more. Yet at the same time, gold and silver, silver basically flat, maybe even down a little bit from that same point, gold up about 50% which like you pointed out has been frustrating for people who saw the money printing and they've seen it go into one set of markets but not the other. Curious if you have any thoughts of why gold and silver haven't responded more given the incredible amount of money printed and then following on to that, if people do start selling stocks which seem to be at a high whereas the precious metals are near their lows, if perhaps that could change that equation a bit. 
Well, okay. In regard to um, the weakness in the gold and silver markets, we had a huge run up in the Bitcoin market. Oh, well, actually, the crypt, all the cryptos. I mean, there's over 2,000 cryptos. And how many of those are really worth anything? I don't want to insult the, the people who are true believers in cryptos, but um, they're um, backed by nothing. And they're, you know, they have, each one has something that is its claim to fame. But that market was run up way too high, way too far, way too fast. I mean, the Bit Bitcoin almost reached twenty thousand dollars in December of two thousand and seventeen, and now it's back around four thousand. You know, that's quite a drop. Well, how many billions of dollars went into cryptocurrencies that would have otherwise gone into the gold and silver market as a realization that the traditional markets, gold, I mean, the um, stock market and the bond market weren't where they wanted to put their dollars. So they put their dollars into cryptos instead of putting their dollars into gold and silver. I can't quantify that as to how much that hurt, but I'm sure that hurt the price of gold and silver some. And then we have the issue of gold and silver manipulation, which has been going on for, you know, I don't know, millennia maybe, but certainly for 50 years. And that, nobody manipulates the price of gold and silver higher. You know, I mean, really, nobody nobody wants the price of gold and silver higher because that points out the fallacy in the delusion that you can print money and create wealth. If you print money and prices go up and the price of gold goes sky high, like it did in the late 1970s and early 1980, it causes massive trauma in the financial system and people worry that the financial system based on fiat dollars is going to crash. Nobody wants that. I mean, certainly not the powers of be. So, you know, we want to control, the, they want to control the price of gold and silver, and that has certainly been of any impact. Um, how much else has been it? If you, you know, the Federal Reserve and the Bank of Japan and the European Central Bank have a fire hose, and the fire hose just spews out trillions of printed digital currency units. Where the fire hose directs the, the next pile of cash is questionable. Is it going to go into Amazon stock? Is it going to go into GE? Is it going to go into the VIX? Is it going to go into gold? Is it going to go into silver? Well, we've seen instances in the past where it's gone into gold and silver, 1980 early and 2011, where those prices skyrocket. We watched crude oil go up to $147 in 2008 and then crash to 35 within a five-month period of time. We watched Amazon, and, and you, if you go back and look at Amazon in the first couple of years of this decade, of this century, it reached, um, I don't know, $50, 60 $70 in 2001 or 2000 before the crash. When it finally corrected, it was down over 90%. Right. So people don't remember that Amazon dropped over 90%. Um, what has Deutsche Bank dropped? They've, you know, that's dropped uh, up down to about $9 today. Look at GE. If you look at the price of GE and on a, look at GE on a monthly scale and then compare it to the S&P 500, the only, the only difference is GE looks like it's ahead of the game and pointing to where S&P 500 is going. Now, maybe that's not true. Maybe we'll crank up another printing press or 10 and put out another few trillion dollars of digital currency units and prop up the stock market. I don't know. But right now, it doesn't look like the Federal Reserve is in the mood to do that. It looks to me like they're in the mood to tighten and gradually raise interest rates, which to me says, look out below for the stock market. And it's about time gold and silver will finally start rising. Just my opinion, but that's the way it reads to me. Yeah, and interesting you mentioned that because uh, I guess it was last week when the Fed had their meeting or commentary and saying that there likely will be the hike in December, but changing the tune a little bit, saying we're close to neutral, which for anyone who remembers 1980, if Paul Volcker had to raise interest rates to 20% then, and geez, even Greenspan, he had one year of 1% interest rates, and by 2006, he had raised to five and a quarter percent. So I'm not sure how Jerome Powell calculates two and a quarter percent with some of the biggest bubbles in history as a neutral rate, but I'm a little surprised that they haven't changed course already. So, I mean, as we've seen turbulence in the stock market, real estate market, I think a lot of the Austrians and gold and silver crowd thought they'd be going back to QE, which hasn't happened yet, but curious your take of that news last week and if you think they'll keep raising rates or will they reverse course and start doing more lowering and quantitative easing soon? 
Okay, well, I'm going to flip a coin here and take a look at it and give you my guess because that's all it is, all right? But my coin flip tells me that what we are right now is a determined Fed to raise rates. You know, the, the, the standard old story, we have to have enough ammunition in our ammunition bag of high interest rates to be able to lower the interest rates to correct the problem that we created. So, you know, the Fed creates the problem, then the Fed raises interest rates so they can lower interest rates so they can fix the problem they created. You know, I call that insanity, but apparently it's modern financial theory. But, you know, that's just an opinion. Um, so my expectation... Economics, one of the two, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, whatever. I mean, just because it's crazy doesn't mean we're not doing it. So... Um, my expectation is we will raise interest rates higher until something breaks. And I don't think anything's really broken right now. All we've done is taken a little froth off the top of the market. And by that, I mean the stock market. We'll raise interest rates until something really breaks. The Fed will ride to the rescue, trumpets blaring, and say, we're going to solve the problem. But once again, we're going to fix the problem, hoping that nobody remembers they created the problem. And then they will start doing QE or some version of that. Or maybe they'll find another way to pump money into the system without making it look that way and they'll try to boost the stock market at that point i think that the problem is that you have so much excess that's been fed into the market the stock market that it's going to take a long time to wring all that excess out and that makes me think that we've got one or possibly three to five years of down market times in the in the s p and the in the stock market before we can come to a sustainable bottom and in the meantime, what happens to the dollar? What happens to interest rates? And, you know, we're going to, we're, I, I read this, this morning that we've got $9 trillion of debt that must be rolled over in the next four years. That's U.S. debt, U.S. national debt, $9 trillion in the next four years. Is that going to roll over at lower interest rates or higher interest rates? Well, I don't know, but my expectation is it's probably going to be much higher. The higher the interest rates, the more the debt service, the more the debt service the U.S. government has to pay, the more they have to print more money. It just seems like a never-ending bad downward spiral. And I see that playing out over the next five to seven years and probably will have some ugly consequences during that time. Um, another thing that worries me, and this worries me a lot, is what happens when pension plans start imploding. Do we just start writing trillion-dollar checks to pension plans and adding that to the national debt? Um, possibly with a different administration, we might, but with this current administration, probably not. But either way you cut it, there's too much debt in the system and too little ability to service that debt. And that tells me we're looking at either default or hyperinflation or both. How do you get around it? And I have seen no credible explanation as to how you're going to get around it. And don't tell me we're going to grow our way out of it because that's not going to happen. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. In fact, uh, before we started, I was actually just speaking with uh, Professor Lawrence Kotlikoff, who had mm -hmm. estimates, and he was saying if you did any sort of rational accounting for Social Security, Medicare, then the actual debt load is over $200 trillion. So yeah, the idea that, all right, we're going to do a little tax cut here, which on one hand is great, you know, if you match that by reducing spending would be even better, but yeah, it's, to me, it's seen for a while it's past the point of no return. And like you pointed out, you either have the implicit default by hyperinflating or an explicit default, which I do find interesting with Trump and his bankruptcy experience. And I hear some folks say that despite some of the rhetoric that comes out that, you know, some of these insiders feel he does realize it's a bubble. He does know the thing has to crash and... I can't see any other way out than one of those two routes. Um, so certainly will be fascinating. And again, when that happens, it seems like we're in agreement that gold and silver are going to, at some point, I know people don't like the weight, but have to be the recipients in some fashion of that going forward. Well, I think that's right. You know, you ask yourself the question, go back to 2008 and watch the stock market falling many percent a day and look at the panic in the streets or listen to the people in 2000 who were saying, I don't even bother to open my 401k statements again because they're so depressing. At that point, before people get to that point, 
after they had the experience of the 1987 crash, the 2000 crash, the 2008 crash, might they think this train, the stock market train has, you know, rolled, has rolled on and, and has gone as far as it's going to go and it's time to jump off and feed as, little, as much capital as we've got into gold and silver because they're real. You know, they've been real for a couple thousand years. And the dollar and the pound, I mean, really, they're, you know, they're, they've been around for a while, but uh, in 500 years, does anyone expect the pound and the dollar to exist? Gold and silver will still exist. When people get scared, they go to something they trust. And, you know, I don't think it's going to be Amazon stock. I think it's much more likely to be silver or gold. And right now with the silver gold ratio, the gold silver ratio at 85 to one, clearly silver is the better buy and the better long-term investment. Um, that doesn't mean it's not going to do something crazy like go way higher and then crash or not. But um, silver has clearly got much more upside than gold and far more upside than Amazon or GE or Deutsche Bank. Yeah, and I know in one of your latest columns, you wrote a letter to President Trump, and you were actually talking about using silver as money. Obviously, uh, maybe not obviously, but a lot of folks often talk about gold primarily as money. Curious, anything uh, you'd like to touch on about that and why you chose silver and what you think the administration might be well served to do? Well, and I'd love to take credit for that article, but actually it was uh, Hugo Salinas Price that wrote it, and I just reprinted it. Okay. And like I said, I'd love to take credit for it. But his, his basic theory, and I try to keep this really short, is that silver is a means of um, it's, a, it's a means of preservation of assets. It's a, a long-term value. And he is in Mexico, you know, in Mexico it's horrible inflation. They dropped three zeros off their peso some years ago. And Argentina's dropped, if you go back and look at it, 13 zeros off their peso since 1945. Um, the United States, we just managed to, deflate, to inflate to the point of about 100 to 1 since the Federal Reserve. But if you had a silver coin, that the masses could buy and use as a saving, as a means of savings, then you'd have something that would remain valuable for the masses. The, the, the wealthy, the powerful and the wealthy and the political elite are, have their assets in bonds and stocks and such. But nobody, the, the poor people have no means of savings other than stuck with digital dollars, which are guaranteed to, de to devalue. If you had silver coins with no unit of marked on them as to value, you know, you just say one ounce of silver, not one dollar or fifty dollars or something like that. Then it becomes a consistent uh, store of value that the, the 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 masses and the poor people could use and trust. And if they trusted it, they might be more inclined to buy into the economy and buy into the do what's necessary, and they might feel wealthier. The government can control the. the the minimum price of that coin, Hugo Salinas price suggested $30 as a minimum price, and then it would never go below that. But if the price of silver went up, the coin value would go up. So then you have something that maintains value, which all fiat currencies do not. And you would have something that is real, silver, as opposed to something digital or paper. And you would have something that has stood the test of time and that is accessible in small quantities of money, which would be beneficial to the poorer and, and lower middle classes. I think it's a great idea. Um, I think that it's not going to be very well accepted by the political and financial elite, so it probably won't happen. But I consider it a very good idea for um, the people who are largely not represented in our world. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And uh, certainly, I don't think the politicians and bankers will adopt it. But fortunately, one of the things that find beautiful about financial markets and economics is that while well, things get out of line from time to time, nature and the markets eventually impose their will. And certainly like you've been saying, it seems like at some point that will flow into gold and silver. Uh, and so perhaps in wrapping up, maybe you could just let folks know where they can find you so they can stay up to date. There's a lot of great research you're putting out on your site. Again, also, I uh, mentioned you write for Miles Franklin, so if uh, that's an option, if people are actually interested in purchasing gold and silver, there's a way that you can recommend for them to do that as well, and just let them know how they can find you. 
Well, thank you very much for the compliments. Um, I do write for Miles Franklin. I typically write one article a week. And um, you can go to milesfranklin.com and you can read the articles there, along with a number of others, including yourself, that have good things to put out. Miles Franklin does an excellent job of educating. And that's why I believe they, they want writers who are writing things that are valuable um, and not necessarily the, the standard party line out of, out of New York to um, write for them. And, and I'm very appreciative of the fact that they have uh, contracted with me to write for them. Um, I'm also available on my own website that I've had going for over six years, and that's deviantinvestor.com. And there I just publish a few things, including the like the most recent one from Hugo Salinas Price, as well as my own writings. And I don't publish a lot of articles, but I publish two to three a week. They're worth reading. Uh, no, not trying to overwhelm anybody, but they're just worth reading um, as long as you aren't buying the standard Washington, D.C., New York economic line and printing money is good and everything is going to be wonderful because we're going to create wealth out of the thin air. And, and, um, and by the way, the Easter Bunny is coming too, you know. So uh, if, you, if you're not really into that, then uh, try reading DeviantInvestor.com. Yeah, and I, I love the way you phrased it because uh, especially when I was getting away from my Wall Street and MBA Keynesian indoctrination, Again, it was reading folks like you and the other Austrians that do put these things clearly. And we're seeing subprime bubbles in advance, whereas a lot of Wall Street just called it the perfect storm and said, let's pile on another layer. So again, uh, recommend to folks checking out your work at the Deviant Investor and at Miles Franklin. Um, I think you're doing a great service of letting people know what's happening in challenging times. So thanks again for joining me today, and we will look forward to checking in with you again soon, Gary. Great. Thank you very much.